First of all, let me welcome you to our, our day, to our second Aspen Keller conference, uh, Filling the Governance Gap. Um, many of you have seen yesterday at dinner already, but uh, my name is Daniel Diermeyer. I'm uh, one of the co-organizers of this conference today with, together with Judy Samuelson of the Aspen Institute. And uh, my job is here, I'm a professor at the, at the business school and I also am the director of the Kellogg Public Private Initiative, which is one of our four new strategic initiatives here at Kellogg. And my, when I have to explain this to people, because it's a, it's a mouthful, I always tell them that uh, the Kellogg Public Private Initiative is for people that want to engage with society or have to. So that's my, <laughs> that's the way, that's the way I'm thinking about it. And um, uh, this conference is really kind of spot on. Uh, on some of the issues uh, that, uh, that fall right into this, this area. Um, I thought I, what I'll do is just to give you a little bit of an idea of kind of how the day will be structured today, what the thinking was behind uh, uh, this year's conference, and then we'll get started with our first panel. Uh, before I get going, though, I want to introduce uh, a very important person, Sheila Duran, she's sitting over there. And Sheila has been responsible for putting all of this together, the administrative logistics side, I'll just say a few things um, after our panel, a couple of housekeeping items, but if you have any questions or concern, uh, Sheila will take care of you. So let's get started on <coughs> what this conference is about. Um, so what the series of conferences that we have been engaging with with the Aspen Institute is really based on is the idea of exploring the area of business and society uh, in a setting that uh, we don't typically find. So our goal really is, and I think we've almost succeeded mathematically, to have an equal number of um, academics, uh, representatives from the corporate world, and then also representatives from civil society, NGOs, and so forth. I think we almost have one third each, uh, which we work very hard to just get right. Uh, but the idea is really is to engage in a dialogue uh, on these issues, on the issue of the relationship between companies and society, and what, we, what my goal is, and, and uh, this is really what we've been trying to do last year and this year, is to go a little bit beyond the slogans. And uh, the typical things that you find at the large conferences, that's why we keep it at the size uh, where dialogue is still possible, um, and really go into the nitty gritty of what it means uh, to work through the alignment between enterprise, uh, private and social value, advocacy, uh, and all of that in a global context. That's our goal. So I encourage you throughout the discussion um, to really kind of go to the depth of this. We have a terrific lineup of people uh, from the corporate world, uh, from the NGO world, um, from academia. So take advantage of that. And not only in here, but also, uh, of course, during the networking breaks and so forth. So a couple of thoughts on the, on the theme. Um, this theme really... The idea of, to this particular uh, topic came, I would say, like maybe a couple of years ago and then was reinforced this year. And it really started um, when, you may recall, uh, Apple had its issue over labor relations uh, at its supplier, Foxconn. And um, was reinforced, at least for me, um, earlier last year, or last year, almost a year ago now, uh, when the collapse of the Bangladeshi garment factory occurred. Um, that had widespread consequences for uh, some of the leading fashion brands, um, um, retailers, um, and so forth, in the way down to Disney. And what it, what it highlighted, I think, this is something that Judy said yesterday, is that we're living in an age where business has become arguably the main driver of social and economic change in the world. Not just economic change, but social and political change in the world as well. And uh, that means is that businesses are being held accountable for the consequences of this change now. And uh, we see this in a whole variety of different dimensions, but we particularly see it uh, when we're dealing with areas where there, what we call here, there is a governance gap. And uh, I, it was insightful to me yesterday to hear Jose Luis Prado talk about that on a whole bunch of dimensions. You may re recall, those of you that were at dinner, that he was mentioning about uh, uh, he was talking about breastfeeding, right? The benefits of breastfeeding. And, uh, and then he mentioned the World Health Organization. And he said, well, the World Health Organization position is that every country should have their own position. And, and that was, uh, th that gives you a clue, I think, of exactly where the challenges are. Uh, you go back to the agreement that finally came out out of the collapse of the Bangladeshi garment factory, 
And it was basically brokered by NGOs, by a bunch of multinational companies um, that uh, decided that in two different versions, and also we don't have to go into the details, uh, that they would abide by certain uh, supplier standards. Now, to me, the striking thing about this is that national governments played virtually no role, neither did the United Nations. So this is basically a, a, a new way of how to think about a regulation of how to structure global commerce that is uh, untouched by the type of typical public institutions that we're familiar with. And of course, that raises a whole variety of issues. What are the consequences? What's the legitimacy? How does it really work? Is this really a big deal? Is this the flavor of the month? How do companies think about this? And what's the role of NGOs uh, in, this, in this whole environment? And um, just to give one more shout out to our friends from the advocacy and NGO community, uh, Edelman has this annual trust survey, um, Jose Luis was mentioning it yesterday as well, and among the kind of four main public or influential institution, media, politics, business, and NGOs, uh, NGOs are now the most trusted institution anywhere in the world, in every country where they have data, and the gap between uh, businesses and NGOs is growing. So the role and the impact that NGOs have been playing in this, in this space has only been increasing, and so it's particularly a pleasure for me that we have some of the leading NGOs uh, speaking to us today and participating in this dialogue, and you'll have a great panel a little bit later today. So that's the agenda. Not much to talk about for a day, but we'll, we'll try to fill the time anyway. Uh, so these are big topics. I hope we will we'll be able to uh, look into a whole variety of dimensions and walk away with new and refreshing insights. Our first task is now to start with our first panel. And uh, our panel will be uh, consisting of uh, one of the leading advisors uh, in this space, uh, Harlan Loeb, one of the, the pioneers from the corporate world, uh, Roxanne Desik, who is now uh, le giving her wisdom and advice to much needed advice to a variety of companies in, as a corporate director. And then I'm just going to be there to fill up the panel. But uh, it will be moderated by my dear colleague and friend, David Austin Smith. David is a professor here at the Kellogg School, and he used to be also our associate dean until a year ago, right? No, not that long. Not that long. <laughs> half a year ago, half a year ago. So uh, he, has, he has done his service, and uh, just, just uh, a couple of things. You find his bio in your folder, but David is one of the preeminent political scientists of his generation. Uh, it's a very influential work, and his, has been playing a huge role uh, in creating the kind of intellectual infrastructure here at Kellogg. And I should say, as a side note, uh, he was one of my advisors in graduate school and tried to talk sense into me, but with moderate success. But here we are. David, take it away. And then Harlan and Roxanne, if you could join me here as well. Thank you very much, Daniel. So it's my pleasure to open up uh, the proceedings today, a formal one, so in terms of the first panel. Um, I'm, I have a chair here, and I'll sit in it. And I couldn't decide what to do, and I tried sitting in it. And I can't walk into this classroom and sit down in the front. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it, there are nods from my academic colleagues. It's, you know, you're sort of Pavlovian. You come in front of an audience, you get to talk, you stand up, you make sure they're listening to you. Sitting down in a comfy chair at this time of day, I'm going to nod off. So anyway, so um, I, I want to... Daniel flagged where we're starting today um, and mentioned a couple of things. But I, I think on this, on this panel, um, I'll introduce the panelists in a moment. Daniel's given us a flavor, and I'll reinforce that as we move in. Um, what I want to do is I want to, I want to begin by saying something about how I'm going to think about, or I'd like the panelists to think about um, what we want to talk about, the aspect of it today. And that is the role of what I would call direct activist action or what Daniel and um, David Barron, in particular at, at Stanford, have called for many years the rise of, of private politics in this, and the role that activists and NGOs play in prompting, shall I say, um, corporations and industries to change their behaviors. Okay, so the, for the title of, the, of, this, uh, of this particular session, When Public Institutions Fail, The Rise of Private Governance, is something I'd like to take credit for, but I can't. Um, but it may be something that's a little opaque to some people, so I want to make it concrete, and I'm going to use a familiar example to many of us, if not all of us, uh, which is the Rainforest Action Network, which began life in the 80s um, 
to try and stem the logging in particular and the destruction of old growth forests around the world. Uh, and they started in the Amazon Basin especially. And they worked in a classical way at the beginning. They worked through trying to influence regulation through the political process. And they did that for a few years and got totally frustrated. So they switched gears to try and engage corporate players directly uh, with, with some success. And so this was something they continued with. And in 2000, they decided to target Citigroup uh, as the largest project financing bank in the world at the time, uh, with lots and lots of projects being financed in, in, um, for basically uh, tearing apart the old growth forests in South America. And they wanted to go after them and stop the, the idea being stop the funding, you'll stop the projects. And so they did that, and they, and they engaged with a public letter, they engaged in uh, shareholder meetings, and eventually Citigroup agreed to talk to them, and they talked, and they talked, and they talked. And for two years, Citigroup did a terrific job of holding off RAN at arm's length. And then they lost patience, and they went to the streets. And they engaged in protests, they put dumped bags of wood chips in the lobbies of various Citigroup banks, um, my favorite was in 2003, Sandy Weil, the, the CEO of Citigroup at the time, received thousands of Valentine cards from all around the world, which must have been a surprise, I suspect. Um, but they, they went, um, some things were a little marginal, some things were very aggressive, they got celebrities to cut up Citigroup cards and so on. Um, at the end of the day, in 2004, Citigroup essentially said, okay, enough's enough. Uh, they agreed to back down, they had environmental concerns, they changed their procedures, they self-regulated in a very aggressive way. It was a terrific success for RAN. The important part of this, part of this is not only that Citigroup were persuaded to, to do what RAN wanted, the Rolling Forest Action Network, but the other banks saw what happened to RAN. And the Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Chase, and others Automatic, well, automatically, immediately afterwards, pretty much self-regulated, in some cases in a rather more draconian and aggressive way than Citigroup did. Because of the threat of what can happen to you, and it's an irritant for many of them, but it became a very, very uh, a costly irritant over time, which was Rand's insight on this thing. So what I want to focus on today, and would like to ask the panelists a few questions um, about how they see this rise of activism or the threat of activist threat and, and the role that plays in the kind and the quality or, and the level of self-regulation that we see. And, and the, the game plan is that I'm going to ask a few questions. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I don't suppose I'll get through my list of four, um, knowing at least Daniel, and, and reliably inform that, that he gets on well with Harlan and Roxanne. So the chance of my getting through this introduction much longer is, is you know, close to zero. So I'm going to work on it. Um, they'll stimulate other interest, and then I hope we'll have uh, 20 minutes, maybe a little longer um, at the end for, for questions from the floor. But I mean, our panelists, as Daniel's already introduced them, we have Roxanne uh, Desik, served as EVP, Global uh, Executive Vice President of the Global Government Relations for Royal Dutch Shell, so has some on-the-ground experience with some of this, I suspect. Um, she's a Ford Scholar here at, our, at the center that Daniel directs, and we're happy to have her around. And she serves on many active uh, corporate philanthropic boards, has a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, Chicago Council of Global Affairs. The list is very long. My favorite is the president of the Georgia O'Keeffe um, uh, Museum. So I think that, you know, that alone makes her worthy to have on any panel on pretty much any subject. Because you know you've got something to talk about during the break. Um, we also have Harlan Loeb, who from uh, Northwestern Law School. He's a professor there on litigation and, and the court of public opinion at our law school. We're happy to have him. Uh, but he's also a, a world-round expert on uh, risk management um, and crisis management. And he's uh, got extensive experience in the finance industry, um, but all the way through to NGOs, hedge funds to NGOs. You pretty much covered, covered the base there. Um, and Daniel is Daniel. And we've had two introductions from Daniel so far um, since 6.30 this last night. And so I'm not going to pile on. Um, I don't, you know, you'll find out who he is if you don't already know. Um, but we're definitely happy to have Daniel here. So um, without more ado, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, open up with our first, uh, first question, or my first question. Um, 
And it was again sort of uh, 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 prefaced by um, which some, a couple of remarks Daniel said and the topic of this general conference, um, which I think private activism of the sort that RAN illustrates, it's increasing rapidly, it's not going away, um, in, at least in the foreseeable future. Uh, it's especially active in US and Europe. I'm, I'm fond of saying that, that activist um, activities is essentially a luxury good. We don't see it in countries, indigenously in, in many countries, which are struggling to survive. Um, and many, many of the, more of these groups, I think, are responding, particularly with the advent of social media and Twitter and so on, is helping facilitate the cost of this, or lowering the cost of this. Mike Brune of RAN observed that when asked why did he switch from trying to influence policy directly, he argued we could create more direct democracy in the marketplace than in government, which is his perspective. So the question really concerns the legitimacy of this. So I, I, I want to ask the panel, to what extent do you think activist pressure of the sort that I, I've illustrated um, does in fact create more democracy? Um, or as it becomes more widespread, it's easier to, to implement by activist groups, is it likely to result in the imposition of minority views on governments, on, excuse me, on corporations and regulations, who might in some cases, and I'm sure we all have our favorite anecdotes, um, look like they're being subjected to blackmail? Essentially, do this, or we're going to cause trouble for you out there in the media. Um, so the question then is the legitimacy of this activity and the extent to which, and I'm interested personally, the extent to which we're going to see induced regulation of activist activity in producing self-regulation. So are we just pushing the problem back a level? <laughs> right? So we let the activists do the regulation, but now we as governments or our governments have now got to regulate the activists in how they get the regulations implemented. So uh, perhaps we could start off with, with, uh, with Roxanne. Uh, so I'll plunge in, uh, and I'll just say two things. Uh, my last job at Shell was in government relations. The job just before that was corporate affairs director and chief sustainability officer. So I have had uh, a lot of interaction with, if not some of you in your room, in this room, many of your colleagues around issues that have been important to activists and also significant to Shell. Um, and I'm not going to talk about Brent Spar. So if you want to hear about that, talk to Daniel. He wrote about it in his book. Um, but I am going to talk about uh, 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 two aspects of what, uh, of what we just heard in terms of this question. One is the question of sort of democracy in private governance. And I've always been puzzled why that question comes up. Because especially with respect to ad hoc activities, that is to say pressure against a single corporation on a major issue that results in change because that company adopts standards or changes behavior that possibly influence others in the industry, it strikes me there's zero democratic about it. A company has reacted to pressures, as it would to market pressures or any other pressures, um, and change occurs, which we hope is for the good because we hope that the, the, the stimulating force actually represented uh, a priority in terms of social policy or environmental policy or something else. I think the question of democracy is even more pertinent with respect to broad standards that are essentially driven by industry participation. And these can range from things like the Responsible Care Act in the chemical industry, which arose in North America in the 80s, all the way through ISO 14000, which is essentially private governance and has now been adopted yeah. by governments as well. Um, there's even a recommendation from the Department of Energy that the industry involved in fracking create its own self-governing set of standards and organization, which I have to say I think is a good idea in the absence of strong government structure. But there are some real problems that strike me as relevant against this sort of is this democratic question. First of all, most voluntary codes, whether they are... Um, the UN Global Compact or the Equator Principles or a potential fracking industry association have little third party assessment. So there is very, it's very difficult to verify whether or not the so-called members or uh, signators or uh, however they define sort of their, their uh, uh, sphere of influence are adhering to the codes in any way that is uh, verifiable to interested parties. And I think the second real question is enforcement. Uh, one of the things that is actually inherent in government regulation is that there are ways to enforce 
um, uh, sanctions of various kinds against departures from behaviors against the code. And what do you do in a voluntary association? If some guy doesn't do well management well in North Dakota, what is the fracking uh, communal organization going to do? Put them out of business? Not allow them to get contracts? It's very difficult to figure out how, if you think about the normal operations of public governance, private governance can fill the gap completely. So I guess that would be kind of my starting out thoughts. Thank you, Harlan. Uh, let me just start with a, just to give you a sense, um, uh, in a very kind of tangible and serious way, how um, pervasive I think activism has become. And my, I think, primary exhibit is one, I, I would say, ripped from the headlines today, and that is the branding of weather. So if you, you look at Polar Vortex 5, um, and you think about it, and we kind of look at it, and when I was a kid, there was an expletive that preceded cold weather to describe Polar Vortex 1, or 2, or 3. <laughs> and so when you see um, Apple with Polar Vortex 5 and Nike wedding product with, with you know, action, uh, it's, it's kind of something amazing to behold that we're branding weather and we have corporate sponsorships. Um, but in, in all candor, as, we, as I look at this, and I look at this having worked as a, an activist in the civil rights, as a lawyer and an advocate in the civil rights community for a number of years, and I look at beginning law practice and environmental law where that was compliance driven, um, corporate accountability, corporate governance, and you look at kind of the origins of the EPA, for example, in the Nixon administration, and you fast forward to today, we've really, we've gone from, I think, a compliance-driven governance model, um, where if you look at, at those of you that are, that had made the mistake that I did and practice environmental law for a couple of years, and had to decipher the Clean Air Act, um, for a client that was equally illiterate, the, um, you saw that, that essentially government was imposing uh, communal responsibility, corporate communal responsibility and organizational responsibility, even if there was no connection um, in terms that we understand. If you owned property, even for 12 seconds, under most environmental laws and retroactive, you are and were responsible for the entirety of, of the issue. I think most of us understand that. Fast forward to today, and if you look at it, I, I, I kind of deconstruct it in three different ways. One is I don't believe that all activism is equal. I think, and all activists certainly are not equal. I, I think it's important to understand, or as we look at it, is who, what, when you look at activism in different categories, who's the natural constituency of, that, of the activism, whether it's an NGO or the, act, the tide of activism? And thus, as, as companies begin to look at this more critically, both in the context of what Roxanne brought up when they're, when they're a targeting campaign, or they look at it um, from a principles-based compliance mechanism, if they look at their supply chain and they want to adopt a governance system that enables them to be more adaptive, reflexive, resilient thinkers, um, there's, a, there's, there's a, a bit of thin slicing that has to go on. And the point I usually make in this context is the activism that touches human health and safety, and I think I talked about this with a number of people last night, I think Judy or, or a couple, we talked about it. Um, Sheila and I talked about it. Our, there is a huge gap between individual activism. What is our activism moment? When is the moment that I say, I take a look at the sho shoes and socks I wear and I say I am morally outraged by the means of production on these shoes and that's, and I will not do that. The gap between the activism on that issue as a, as, a, as a force against organizations and companies and the, and, and the kind of private governance, literally private, my own governance, there's a huge gap there. Health and safety, food, very tight connection. The closer it touches on our individual, literally individual um, well-being in a tangible and immediate way, the closer the alliance is between the, the, the I don't want to say proxy in a, in a pro, pejorative sense, they're, it, they're, you're, they're pretty much in lockstep. And I, I think we're at the early points of understanding, what does that mean? What, is it significant? I don't have the answer, and I look forward to hearing some. What, is it significant, and if so, to what extent, that the activism of individuals, 
what we call what I would call slacktivists. They think it's great that you're, that that um, the, um, there are a number of us, and myself included, that are slacktivists. We think it's phenomenal that people are going after Foxconn or that China is using Foxconn because they finally get the the message on quality. So they're going after Fox. They're going after different agencies on quality. And you see in the aftermath of Bangladesh, we're absolutely thrilled that there are that there is a massive amount of attention put on that because of the moral outrage is significant. But moral outrage on that level is not, is not a sustainable, is not a sustainable form of act, personal activism. So you be, then begin to look at, so I, I, existentially, I, I fundamentally have that question, is where, where and how do those align? And what does it mean to corporations as they think about private governance? And is it an incentive to lead or is it an incentive to, to you know, to, uh, to kind of take a you know step aside and say you know what our consumers really don't care about the salt content in our product, or our consumers really don't care where their clothes are made. So if we're Gap, we can we can do a few things cosmetically, do a box check. We'll get into some strategic philanthropy and we've solved the problem. Don't know the answer to that question, but then you look at the the connection and you've seen it recently. And I'll just end with this um, between c companies looking at their business and looking how what what they need to do in order to in order to, to be poised for success three or four years down the road. So if we worked on this, CVS withdrawing cigarettes from their, deciding they're not selling tobacco anymore. And there was cost to that. They're, I mean, there was economic consequence, immediate. Um, and their decision was fundamentally that if we're going to be a health company and we're gonna have Minute Clinic and we're gonna hold ourselves out as a health company and actually become one of the leading health companies, they're an enormous company leading health companies, we can't also sell cigarettes. Admirable, widely praised, the, from every, the White House to, you know, to rural, you know, rural communities. Um, the question becomes, you, you, and this is what we went through, what, what risks do you then open up? Do you, are you then vulnerable, and this is true, with unions targeting legislation that regulates dietary supplements? Because they're not regulated, nobody knows about it. Do you then open? How how do you then determine what your matrix or your activation moment looks like with other things? Sugar, you know, high, you know, high fructose corn syrup and the products you sell. So the question is: is once you've st stopped, once we live in an age of an activism and an age of advocacy. So once you've you step into the ring, I think you've got to be fully prepared for how not how what values metric are you going to use to make determinations. Um, on the next round of, of uh, issues that, that come up. Thank you, Harlem. Daniel, would you like to? Sure, I'll, I'll add a few things. And uh, you know, some of the themes are really like uh, were touched upon. But um, I mean, for, to me, what's fascinating here is that uh, that this mechanism is number one growing so fast and it's so pervasive and it raises all these new questions. So just to kind of come back to my little Bangladesh example there. I'm old enough to remember that in the olden days, if you wanted to have an impact globally, you would protest in front of the country's embassy. Does, does anybody still do that? I mean, standing there with signs, or then, I, I, it just seems so quaint and kind of like a, a 20th century, right? It's like, a, we, we don't do that anymore. What we do now is uh, we look for uh, ways to basically leverage uh, global supply chains and other forms of economic activity uh, for social for social advocacy. That's the that's the new thing, and that's the new that's the new mechanism. And I think that at the face of it, it's it's uh, it's very clear what's happening, and it's it's understandable because if you think about it, you have this uh, you have this globally integrated economy now, and. Uh, even though we may say, well, that's the Bangladeshi government's responsibility, nobody believes that that solves the problem. There's just like there's lack of, of uh, government and regulatory capacity there, let alone governance issues that are so pervasive in emerging economies. So you, so throwing up your hands there basically says like, well, whatever, right? So that's that's not a solution. The United Nations, as we said before, is not going is usually not capable of acting in these things because of the internal politics there. Uh, and then you have like uh, is the U.S. government going to make that its number one policy, foreign policy prior priority? I, I doubt it. So, so there is this gap. I think there is this sense that um, we have this we have this globally integrated economy, but there is really, from a governance point of view, it's kind of laissez-faire. There's really nothing that's that's that has stepped in 
to that process. And then just domestically, I mean, your fracking example, I think is a great example. And I know Mike Vandenberg will talk about this this afternoon and said, I wanna, I wanna go too deep into this, but you look at like, a, you look at um, um, so many areas of like, a, of a domestic issues where because of a political gridlock and so forth, uh, basically, there's no movement at all. I mean, think about just the whole area of climate change, uh, the collapse of cap and trade, and so forth. I mean, we've been talking about this for 20 years uh, without any progress. And so, uh, so it's completely understandable, I think, that, um, that these new mechanisms are being explored and evolving. And now, coming back to David's question about legitimacy, so uh, I think there are two ways to think about this. One of them is like, what are the consequences of this? And I think we're just beginning to understand that. Um, there have been some uh, trade economists, very distinguished international economists, that have been very critical of the Bangladesh Agreement. Jagdish Bhagwati, for example, one of the leading uh, trade economists, has been very critical. I think he misunderstood the agreement, but never mind. Uh, his point was is that these agreements have unintended consequences for development, particularly for the participation of women in the workforce, that one has to be careful about. Now, I disagree with his point, but, but what's, I think what's correct is to have a candid dialogue about really what are the, what are the social consequences uh, of these types of agreements. And our celebrated Foxconn example, uh, Apple is now shifting its suppliers to another supplier. Okay, so Foxconn basically has, has, has taken on these uh, requirements and Apple is shifting its supplier base. So what does that mean? Okay, and what are the consequences of them? How do you design these things so that they work? These are all, I think, hugely important um, and, uh, and uh, pressing questions. Now, what is different about <coughs> traditional regulatory mechanisms or political mechanisms is, um, you know, they can be just as impactful as a, as a law, I mean, if Walmart decides we're only going to buy as, uh, fish from sustainable fishery, that's, that has this, almost the same effect as if the U.S. government says so. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but the consequences, the social consequences are alike. Yet it's a private entity that has its own reasons to do that, perhaps in response to pressure, perhaps in response to consumer demand, whatever it is. Um, so the process that we all so love, elections and legislatures and courts and all of that, that's all out. And we have this, we have this uh, negotiations and uh, sometimes threats and sometimes collaboration, which reminds me a lot more about international relations. You know, in this case, you know, kind of like <coughs> peace agreements and things like that. And they're, they're not perfect. They have their structures. But I think that's, that's the reality of what we're dealing with. I think the thought that um, we can just go back to kind of traditional political solution is fantasy. Uh, it's not going to happen. And so this is a reality, and we better understand it, and then we think about how we can shape it and uh, have an influence and drive it in a direction that's positive. Thank you. I, I was interested, actually, in Harlan's observation about, um, about once you start and down this road with CBS, what are the next implications? Because exactly that's it. Well, I don't know whether it is, but it struck, struck a chord with Apple. You know, let's say uh, last week or the 14th or 15th, in the FT about how Apple is leading an electronic industries coalition for citizenship, which is basically designed to get smelters in Africa uh, to be conflict free. You know, they, they, as opposed to um, the smelters in Africa, which produce, I think, tantalum, which is I never heard of it before. But tantalum yeah, is in name. everybody who in this room with an iPad <laughs> or an iPod has tantalum <laughs> inside it, and they're big in microchips. But a lot of them come from. Uh, mines which are um, using slave labor, um, the, the profits from the mines go to support terrorist <coughs> organizations and banditry and so on. And Apple has been very uh, upfront and aggressive in leading a coalition to identify the smelters that are conflict free and are not. And they're getting ahead of Dodd-Frank regulation which requires them to report this and going way beyond. And um, it, it can't to me, I read this, I said this is not an accident. He never mentioned Phelpscon. Um, at all, but it has to be as a consequence, I think, in part of the Foxconn mm -hmm. thing. So this is this is that these subsequent follow-ons, I think, are important. So I, we, we've heard about the Rana Plaza um, a couple of times so far, and I'm going to bring it up again, a slightly different twist. And and this is something that I know people have thought about in this room, in particular Caroline Cabe, who's just joined us, uh, wrote a nice piece on this. But as as a consequence of this, there was a response to the Rana Plaza collapse. It was pretty rapid as these things go. And what's interesting to me, and I'd like the panel to hear what the panel has to say about this, 
are the differences between the two approaches that were adopted, right? So in May, as a response to the outrage, we received we, uh, a group of um, garment factories uh, and producers, excuse me, not factories, garment uh, 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 retailers and producers, um, signed on to the Accord on Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh, right? And, and uh, these are now about 132, uh, signatories to this. Almost all of them are from Europe and Asia. There are a few American firms there, but they tend to be the smaller ones. But there's 132. And the, a core feature of this particular um, uh, uh, agreement, this voluntary self-regulation, is that they've explicitly adopted legal liability for worker safety all the way down their supply chains, which is dramatic. Now, the, the competing, if you will, um, uh, uh, agreement is the Alliance of Bangladesh Worker Safety, which came in the July of, of uh, last year, late in July, and that currently has 26 signatories, all of them from North America, and all of them the big brands, so, um, uh, uh, sort of including Walmart and, and so on. And they are conspicuously not accepting any legal liability for anything. They are making a commitment to engage in more aggressive monitoring, encouragement, working with governments, working with um, building uh, 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 developers and so on for factory safety, um, and doing all the things that we, we um, feel good about. Right? But it doesn't have this legal liability accepted. So um, the question I have for the panel then is, so what implications do you see from what I, what I take to be a very striking difference in approach and perhaps it isn't, um, between the European, essentially the European and the US accords here, um, in regard to their willingness to accept formal responsibility for supply chain calamities in a legal way. Um, uh, the sort of things I have in mind, the concerns I have in mind, or the questions I have in mind regard, um, do we see this as a market advantage for the Europeans over the Americans? Can we see them capitalizing on this? Uh, is this going to be something that feeds into the slacktivists, that they're going to respond in the marketplace? Um, is this going to change the nature of regulatory relationships in the industry across um, the different uh, global areas, the spatial um, um, structure of this industry? And, and are there any implications we, that we should worry about? Is this just going to be something that's going to be absorbed, that people are going to think about this in the same way um, when push comes to shove? Tackle that, Harlan? That sounds uh, like I, law to me. I, 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 yeah, I yeah. love how they pass the baton. Um, well, Carolyn Cabe is here, and so I'm going I'm to steal from her uh, talk track a bit, or something that I've learned from her. Um, is if you look at, and if you look at the the the, the legal mechanisms to enforce uh, wrongs or or uh, civil or criminal uh, issues across your supply chain, the legal mechanisms in Europe are much different than the United States and Asia, and so in many cases whether or not they signed that voluntary accord, they'd be responsible legally for many of the things that would, particularly the, the building issue or, or any of those kinds of things, would, would has kind of liability implications all the way to back to the top for the, for the offending institution as well as the, ulti, you know, the end beneficiary, the ultimate, benef the ultimate, ultimate benefactor. So in my cynical lawyers had, I look at that as being essentially a codification in many ways of some of what is already an existing <coughs> legal structure. So as much as I'd like to praise companies that may choose to sign that, I'm not sure that they've signed on to anything more than, dramatically more than what they were already obligated to do in the first place. Um, what the, the second, um, the second, these, these accords, and we think about them a lot, every single client that we, that we have in our practice is, has activism as one of their main, what I would say, episodic challenges. As, be, as between systemic issues and more episodic, activism is, is highly episodic. So, what, so the question then becomes is you have those two accords, and this is actually a, a real case, but what if, what, if the one, what if your policy already, for reasons that you articulated actually, is better than both? Levi Strauss. That's a client of ours in, on the West Coast. Theirs is incredible. That's right. Far, mm -hmm. far more comprehensive, verifiable, transparent, open. I mean, it, it's incredible. So what happens when they're, they're asked to sign it and there's all this pressure, they're a huge brand, mm 
Nobody, you know, facts are completely negotiable in this day and age, as we know, and nobody has to own a factual record. Um, unless, you're, unless your ox is being gored, then I urge you as companies to own your factual record because no one else is going to own it for you. What happens then? You know, what do you do? You're being pushed with these two different accords, and you're saying, well, we're already exceeding that, and if it's almost like compliance with the tax code, if you comply with one section, you're already in violation of another. Um, so that, I think, in my mind, is the huge, those are the kind of the salient takeaways as I look at, as, as we read through those two um, covenants. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that, I mean, first of all, I think you make a really good point, uh, and I think it, it, it behooves those who observe these kinds of things to understand what additional liability anybody took on, or whether they were simply living up to accountabilities that existed but were little known, or possibly even ignored. Um, but beyond that, I think, you know, inherent is in these two different kinds of, of, of uh, approaches and these two different sort of associations is the enforceability of the 26 American or North American yeah. companies. What happens? I mean, first of all, what are they? What is the standard against which they're operating? If it's simply to advocate in, be, you know, in the direction of good with decision makers, that's a fine thing to do, and perhaps it takes a little bit of the heat off the individual companies. But does it actually drive change? And if there is a standard that you could actually measure performance against, what happens when there's a gap? And it strikes me the only enforceability turns out to be completely non-democratic, mm -hmm. and that is market forces or contracts. So it's, you know, if I'm a supplier to Walmart and Walmart requires that I do something, that is going to be a contractual you know, impetus for me to adhere to a standard. Or if I'm exposed in the marketplace and either consumers or activists say, we don't like your behavior, so we're going to boycott you, that's, a, of course, another. But it's... It's very difficult for me to figure out then how much will actually change under a North American kind of agreement versus enforcing, even if it is just marginally more than existed before, real liability for problems under mm -hmm. the first model that you described. And it, for me, it comes down to enforcement, what happens when people simply don't comply. So I'll, I'll add. I guess like a couple of comments on, on both of you. So the first one, Levi's is just a great example. I mean, Levi's did this 20 years ago, 20 years ago. And one of the big debates they had was like whether they wanted to manufacture in China. I think it was like 93 or 92 when the debate was. It's just like, it's incredible. And to me, what's striking is most people don't know about it. So they have this record, but on the other hand, they're pretty quiet about it. And uh, uh, which is kind of an interesting and whole interesting twist to that of how do you how do you manage your own brand um, and per perception in the marketplace in these contexts whether you do it you come out uh, or the way you do it more quietly. Um, the other thing is just this um, you know I second I think these like uh, the, the the different legal contexts play a huge role here in different liability contexts. There's also an interesting question about these uh, multiple standards. So. Uh, this is a common this is a common issue where you have a tougher standard and a lighter standard, and then there's kind of a, a back and forth between one of them is more endorsed by NGOs, one is more endorsed by industry, and so forth. And um, I think one of the consequences uh, is that it um, it kind of it does take the heat out of the issue. It just complexifies, and when you complexify it, then the uh, the kind of emotional outrage that is so often at the heart of these types of events, it's more difficult to generate because now you have to argue, is it this one or that one? I guess they have a point and so forth, and it diffuses the issue. So from a strategic point of view, just having multiple standards may actually diffuse a lot of the, uh, a lot of the public outrage, which of course has a whole bunch of kind of consequences by itself, and advocacy groups of course recognize that. So that's very different from um, how we typically think about uh, about public regulation. And we don't have competing standards with one. And uh, just as you say, the enforcement issue is a, is, a, is a big question. I think the enforcement here is it's, they have to be somehow self-enforcing. And there has to be some kind of sense of uh, uh, reverting back to a campaign or to shame uh, companies that do not participate. But is that really credible when the spotlight has moved on and we're more interested in Kim Kardashian again. That's the question, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so, how do these things really work uh, if they're not, if they have not become contractual at some point? I think is a, is one of the, the the big open questions of this area. If I could add just one more Please. thing, um, and I don't know the details of these two different sort of mm -hmm. agreements, but um, another 
feature that I think would be worth exploring, and I don't have enough background in it to have a, an opinion myself, is um, the, uh, the long-term effectiveness of the, the kinds of alliances that occur when you have multiple parties represented. So yes, the private sector. Yes, relevant NGOs. Yes, possibly even relevant quasi-governmental or governmental organizations coming together to set standards and have a long-term commitment to participate in the, you know, the evolution of those standards and then the evaluation of performance versus having only the corporate sector step up and say, it's handled. We all volunteered, we locked hands, and we, we're really going to do better from now on, so the heat's off. I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's kind of a, a question I'd like yeah, no, to it's read a, some papers. Um, <laughs> no, I think this is this general issue has come up now at, at our, on the base of every question, which is the question of enforceability and, and durability. Whether it's because the slacktivists get all excited to see something happens, and you know, we're off to Kim Kardashian or whoever it happens <laughs> to be there. Personally, I prefer the royal family, but that, there we go. Um, every country has Take to have poison. one. Yes. <laughs> America is distinctive that it moves them around, you know, periodically. Um, so, but there is, a, there is a, I think, this is a serious question of enforceability, and it's connected very much to the durability of these agreements. Um, and so I was, I was uh, interested in what Thank the you. panel might think about going forward when we think, um, take this as given, that there's going to be growing activist attention, there's going to be growing uh, willingness to engage in this, but we have a very short attention span. There are those of you in this room who are committed, who have um, you know, invested and are investing in, in many of you getting corporations to do things, and those of you in corporations to get, get your corporations to, to engage in society in a more constructive way. And out of that, you know, we have a little optimism that, that the world going forward is going to be a kinder, gentler, more productive world, perhaps, in some dimension. I'll leave it up to you to, to fill in the gaps there, go, as, as the one we're leaving. Um, but at the same time, you know, people being people, there are going to be incentives to abuse that. And there are stories all that you just you type in gap and, and, um, and uh, you know, sort of abusive um, outsourcing, the factories using abusive labor. And there are always stories. The gap isn't living up to its promise, so on and so forth. You know, once you start, it never ends. And the gap now says things, and you get these dramatic uh, um, documentaries that are, that are produced around, and people saying that they're, they're working for ridiculous amounts of money, and that they have to terminate a pregnancy or lose their job. And these are horrible stories. The gap says, yeah, yeah, people have got it wrong. We'll look at it. And now it's not big news, except among the activist community. So this, I think, speaks to the enforceability, the durability of these self-regulations. And I wondered whether the panel had ideas and thoughts about how this is going to go. Is this going to be an, a sort of a never-ending story of short-run agreements that we have to occasionally do something about, that it has to be the next issue is the only time we can go back? Or is this is something where we're going to have these self-regulations and over time, um, you know, the, 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 the profit-making, for want of a better term right now, the profit-making incentive is going to drive... Uh, corporations to find ways around it, just like they find their way around any formal public regulation. If, as I look, you know, if look at it, and it's something both in the, in, what do, in the context of working in an advocacy organization and looking kind of forensically at why companies, you know, what, 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 are, what are the drivers uh, of change? For companies in that context, why are they adopting something just to make it go away? Which I think, in the main, has been what companies have done for the most part. We worked on a for a huge, huge, huge global brand. Had an had a some people would call it chemical if you're pushing an, an agenda, and others would call it an ingredient if you're trying to defend against that agenda. <laughs> um, <laughs> a nutrient, <laughs> a nutrient almost. <laughs> so as we said, you know, it's uh, all you know. We live in an age of advocacy, also. So the um, so the question really becomes one of, and, the, and you've nailed it, the attention deficit issue, just the absolute inability for companies, and they are not fundamentally structured, nor are they rewarded in their minds. They're not incentivized behaviorally to think mm -hmm. about middle or even longer term sustainability in every definition of the, every single definition of that word. So one of the things that we've done when we 
you know, when we look, when we talk to a company and they're, they, they've got a big issue and it's, it's brewing and it, we'll use, we can use activism. We can use palm oil, for example. When we started talking to our clients, Unilever, others about palm oil, sustainable palm oil, the questions we were asking in what our, I come from a legal background, so when I say this, I use it liberally, in our creative brief, meaning what are we trying to solve against? One of the things we've started asking companies, and they're very good on the first two questions, is just explain to us what you do. And they'd go on and, and I, you know, and again, in, in two or three minutes, what do you do? Okay, how do you do it? Just basic, and they, it's usually tactical and mechanical. Why are you, why, why do you do it? The why question. Why, not the why in the, on the how, but why are you in this business and what, why are you doing this? Um, and we did this once in a, at a team exercise that was facilitated by one of the refugees of one of the big management consulting firms. What, if, if the answer is, if the answer for most is money, the word that money, if money is your real answer, then you're probably in the wrong business because most business, that's a hell of a, a lot of effort to make money. Like if, people, if that were the, my answer for my question, if I was in it, first of all, I don't make enough. And second of all, it's a, it's a lot of hard work when I could just day trade or do something else that's all about wealth creation. Um, so when you look at reconciling the why with the, and then you go back to the what and the how, I do think that you will see companies that say in their, in their and it's gotta be leadership driven, that in order to be, to be and as a matter of utility, and a gentleman and I from, from uh, BNY Mellon, we're talking about as a matter of utility, there's going to, I think there you're gonna see some behavioral changes at some companies because they know that they will not exist if they don't have more adaptive, resilient mechanisms for thinking about larger problems. And when 84%, according to our survey, 84% of informed publics in 26 countries, 30,000 people tell you that they expect um, corporations and organizations to take a far more active role on policy formation and, and solving you know, large policy issues, Companies can't just ignore that. So the, question, the, the answer to your question is to, to the extent that a company acknowledges this behavioral prompt, I think you're gonna see some, I think you're gonna see some very clear winners and there'll be fewer of those and a lot of losers. So if you look at Mars Corporation and they're governed by five principles and everything they do runs through one of those functional and, and principles based, um, or you look at Mercedes Benz, which is a famous case study that both uh, Caroline and Daniel have used. If you use it, look at those models, I'm really encouraged. If you look at highly acquisitive financial institutions that, you know, way over their skis, I'm not as encouraged. Yeah, I, Carolyn, I really agree with you that there is a, a, a huge question mark about the durability and sustainability of the kinds of commitments that are made. But I guess two things kind of stick in my mind. Number one, if it weren't for the intervention of activists on an ad hoc basis against an individual company, um, there would still be more abuse on key issues than there was prior to the intervention. So it might have a half-life that isn't terribly long, but it, it does drive some change, and I think that change actually has resulted in something that's good. I think one of the issues with sort of the voluntary commitment to stick to something over a long time in an individual company is also a result of sort of how companies are structured and the fact that even though you wouldn't like to state that the reason you're in this sort of situation is you're trying to make some money, you do have to make some money if you're gonna stay around, right? I mean, the structure of corporations requires that, that shareholders are more or less satisfied with the returns on their investment. And I think even for the most, um, what, well-meaning companies, even for companies that either are enlightened or became enlightened because it hurt too much not to be as a result of a real intervention. Sticking to something that is distinctly different from your competitors for a very long period of time costs money. And it creates a, a competitive disadvantage mm -hmm. that unless there are other ways to show that that's actually distinguishing your company in some way that's meaningful in the traditional corporate kind of definition we have, it's just tough to stick it out. And I think there's also a sense that sometimes in industries where there is a large player who is the one that's targeted, and rightly so, because a big brand is gonna get a lot more attention than a little brand that nobody ever heard of, they bear not only a lot of expense, but 
by sort of fixing things for the industry, because they're the ones who complied, you get a lot of free rider kind of effect, where actually many, many companies don't much change their practice, but because they're operating below the radar screen, they, they kind of perpetuate this competitive advantage, maybe costs less, cuts corners, whatever it does. So I think there are a lot of forces that come to play on corporations yeah, I wanted, when they think about this. I wanted to, because you were there, you remember Harry Kramer making the comment last year in Aspen, mm -hmm. That and we was talking about stock price, and Harry Kramer is a. For those of you who don't know him, he's somewhere near here. I'd imagine uh, as a professor here, <laughs> and the former CEO and chairman of Baxter, um, was talking about stock price and the fixation of CEOs and 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 boards on stock price, and called it a dependent variable. That stock price is not is a dependent variable, and that there's dependent variables. And I would expand this that that um, that concept. That if you look at, at if you look at just in professional services, I think we have to. But many industries, if you look at performance, uh, success, every metric as a dependent variable, and I think that's and there and it's a mindset issue at companies. And some companies are constitutionally either culturally or or idiosyncratically or based on the sector they're in or you, any number of, of of reasons have the mindset to look more, I think, less transactionally and more relationally at the at that dependent variable. What are the dependent variables that, to your point, Roxanne, that enable us to succeed now in the medium term and over time? And as 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 they're again prompted to do that, and to the extent they heed kind of the health warning, and that's usually what it takes uh, to spur action, um, as they heed the health warnings. You know, we've got we live in the, an age now of a tornado watch. There's no question. Is it going to become a, a tornado? Don't know. But it's, which is a clear, permanent tornado watch going on right now. Um, and if they heed that kind of all the all the signs of that, all the cloud formation globally, I do think those that have the mindset to embrace the notion of dependent variables will begin to get this more correct than not. I'll just say a couple of things. I know you want to go to questions, but the last um, la last dimension to that, I think, is this kind of short-term aspect. Um, it's more kind of on the corporate side. So this is a this is something I've heard with like a couple of the companies I've worked with. Um, there's this mindset that if we only do this, it's going to go away. And it kind of has this kind of, you know, kind of crisis mentality. In my sense, is this is not the company that said it, but I just used this as an example. I mean, now if you talk to Exxon, right, it's as likely that Greenpeace is going to go away as that Shell is going to go away. It's just part of your business environment. It's not, it's not a market competitor, but it's in some sense a competitor for public trust. Um, and maybe they're not invited to the table, but now they're there, and yeah, that's what it is. And so you have to take that as seriously as a management challenge as um, anything else, competing for capital, competing for talent, and so forth. And that, I think, we're behind the game still. I think there's still a sense that, um, that number one, uh, it's kind of temporary and we'll have a quick fix. I don't think that's going to work. And number two, there's a kind of a sense of indignation that companies still have is that like, well, who invited you, mm -hmm. right? And uh, <laughs> and we well, just got to get over that and, and move on. And then uh, realize that it is a management challenge like uh, many other as well. And then that's, I think, the beginning of like of enlightenment, right? Is to realize is that uh, you have to engage with that like you have to with a whole variety of other dimensions of your business success and, uh, and then we can get on with things. Good, thank you. But well, I, I doubtless there are many uh, Many more questions to be asked, and, and I'm sure you're going to go ask them for us. Um, so what I would like to do is uh, open up the floor for some questions. We have about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I would ask you, as a matter of um, process, we have, a, we, have one, we, have, we have one microphone. Um, we should have, to, well, since there's somebody over there. I was going to, I was going to identify people, but um, we'll, we'll have one uh, microphone. If you wait till the microphone comes so we can capture you for posterity. Again, I'll emphasize this is for internal consumption. Um, we're not going to find yourself on YouTube or, um, well, I may have a word with some of you depending on what you ask. It's a, <laughs> you know, it's a profit motive. It, no, it's, um, so, it, no, this is very much an internal um, for our own purposes. So if you wait till the microphone comes and we get there. So perhaps you could say who you are and the question. That you James like. Danielson with the uh, Aspen Institute Business and Society Program. I want to pick up a little bit more on the Levi piece, Harlan. So private company, right? How much is that 
what has allowed them to be on the cutting edge of this, as opposed to being a public company, then more importantly, what did you advise them or what would you have advised them in this situation? Were they ahead of the curve? Did they sign the principles or not? Is that a, is that a moment in which they could have said, let's lay down the gauntlet and we're not going far enough? Or what, what, would, what did you tell them? Great questions, uh, Judy. I, it, it does, I think, um, I wouldn't say it makes a material difference that they're a private company. I think it makes a difference um, in that uh, the accountability structures are different and I think decision making, at least structurally, is um, less bureaucratic and less process driven. So I, I, I do think that that, that, that again, is a, is a contributing factor, but it is not a dispositive factor, to use legalese. Um, in the context of what we advised them, it was not to sign it. In that, and, and, and simply because you have, and I think this is why companies need to engage affirmatively in just act, you know, organizations of good faith. There, there are, and I've dealt with many both on both sides of it, organizations, NGOs and others, who really are, have a single-minded single agenda, focused, noble as it may be, are not interested in a civil discussion. And what I mean by civil discussion is where the end result may be we are going to have to agree to disagree on this where we and agree on any number of other things. There were, with Levi's, in addition to the, the ones that I mentioned, numerous, it was like a tsunami of, of attention given that they occupy a huge, to Daniel's point, they're the gold standard. And so you're, they're the first target because if you get the gold standard to adopt, You've, it's like it's like what regula our, our activist regulators do. At, by the way, regulators and now and now re elected officials have become activists. No one nearly effective as the real activists, but they are stealing the page book and being lazy about it. Um, so we told them no, absolutely not. Um, you guys have continued to you know champion the principles, but there's no you, there'd be it would be contradictory for you to sign an agreement that lar most of your core constituents will never read. They won't understand it. And then we did, some, we did some research. There was really, again, it goes to that activism moment. There wasn't that level of moral outrage against them amongst their core constituents. There really wasn't because of the point that Daniel's making. People in the main, and, there, and again, it's, it's, we live in a day and age of big data. We could, the uncertainty gap that used to exist even five, eight years ago can now be, you can winnow that hay pile pretty well. So based on that, based on the fact that they were already occupying the space, they occupied the square, they were, they were holding the line of scrimmage and any other cliche you want to use, the, um, that we just clearly do not. But, but the takeaway from that, I think, most significantly for us in our, in our activism practice is what is the corporate playbook? And I don't mean in a, like, you know, like a martial arts type of sense, but how you can't always be on your heels when, a, when, when an NGO or, or anybody with an agenda begins to, begins, you know, targets you. You need to have, what, what's your, what's your, you know, what's your plan? I mean, it, it's amazing to me how few organizations really have thought through this critically. How do we engage? Do we, you know, many just hide behind their lawyers because it's easy. The lawyers, you know, we can't, you know, hide behind the lawyer. And I say that affectionately to the lawyers that don't allow their clients to hide behind them. Doug? <clears throat> yes, I'm uh, Doug Anderson. I'm professor and dean at the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. So I want to comment uh, a little bit on the market structure aspect of the political economy of advocacy and response and, and seek a comment from, from the panel. It seems to me that uh, there are always asymmetries in any market structure. Uh, so big players, dominant players will have certain economies of scale, small players will uh, uh, have advantages of uh, weakness that they can exploit uh, as it relates to some of these advocacy issues. So doesn't it appear that there might be, in fact, um, a coincidence of wants between market dominant players, big brand uh, names, and advocates uh, that they might get together, establish a requirement that they then seek government sanction for, so that government, in fact, enforces, to your point, Roxanne, enforces the, uh, uh, the rules and regulations because, in fact, big name players, those with deep pockets, 
have advantages in uh, policing those kind of agreements relative to small ones, and it is a way to, in fact, create barriers to entry. Well, I'll comment on that. Um, first of all, I think yes, and I think that if uh, you take even some of the sort of the private governance sort of schemes that are well known, uh, ISO 14000 has been adopted by some governments, and it is now sort of the environmental management standard for companies in their countries. And they were governments that didn't have the means to do it on their own, and so on and so on. And of course, that arose because you know some big players felt that some standards were required. So while it's not as sexy an example as some of the you know real activist interventions lately, I think one of the reasons it's persistent and it's ubiquitous now is because it has become a kind of scheme that governments signed up to as well. Um, I, I you know I think the um, clearly large corporations have more resource to devote to these kinds of things. And they have more pain to feel when they're the ones that are, are you know, targeted for a variety of interventions. One thing that underscores for me the need for this ultimately to involve government as sort of the third player in society, if you think about the private sector, the civil society, and then government, is unless government does get involved, um, I, I wonder if we're contributing to an ever weakening uh, institution. I mean, it's just governments seem kind of weak anyway, and they seem to be getting weaker. And the flaws that have been pointed out by everybody this morning in voluntary private agreements, you know, might become just more and more critical. And I've worked with for some great companies in my life, and I have to say I'm proud of them, and I sit on the boards of companies that I'm very proud of right now. But I don't have a lot of confidence in the wisdom of corporate leaders or boards of directors to do the right thing <laughs> in all these situations. So you kind of want a government player who's independent of all that to be part of these longer term arrangements. Dory? Yes, yeah, Dory McCorder with the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago. The question I had, I actually think Harlan and David hit on it a little bit in terms of activism really being a luxury good um, in terms of that ability to do so. I had the opportunity to sit on a, um, or to sit in and listen to a, um, a congressional finance subcommittee hearing on conflict minerals. And what was interesting about that is that the, the hearing was actually about the, the people from the DNC talking about how what has happened to them, sort of the law of the unintended consequences of now these legitimate um, businesses can't get the money that they need was what their point was. So how do you strike that balance in terms of sort of responding to the activist group that has the loudest voice versus um, understanding what other um, perspectives there could be that actually could benefit different types of people? That's an excellent question, and I, I would like to shamelessly steal your use of luxury activism being a luxury good, but I will not. Um, That's David, so. Uh, oh, I'm oh sorry. it's already, yeah. Uh, oh, it's already there? Yeah. Okay, I'm using it. He owns it. 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 Okay. Oh, is it yours? <laughs> is it like yeah, patent, patent pending, <laughs> but licensable? Patent pending. Um, <laughs> I may need a lawyer. Um, I mean, I get, looking at it kind of this, at this level, and I, and I think it goes to, Roxanne, uh, something that you alluded to in terms of just kind of the capability, you know, and competency, um, and I don't mean this pejoratively, but the capability and mindset of, or of corporate organizations and the mindset of activism. And again, I, I will say, I say this in every, every uh, exercise I do with clients, and it, it used to be Richard Edelman would always say that every company is a media company. A B2B, I don't know, but now literally, even if you're B2B, you know, business, you're in the advocacy business. You have to be in the advocacy business because you have no other choice. As I said, we've, we, and I use this all the time, we've, facts have always been negotiable from the dawn of time. Since the, since it, however you relate to the, 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 uh, the Bible, whether you, as literature or whatever, however you relate to it, one thing is for certain is that the, that's when, the, when it all began. When, at, at, when Adam just tries to evade responsibility by blaming, well, you created her, and she was the one who told me to do it. So, I, I mean, there's suddenly there's this negotiability that goes on. Um, the fast forward, depending on where you fast forward, um, whatever period of time one ascribes to then and now, um, and we've created a, tr a global trading floor for that, and in social media, that is just a global trading floor where facts are in evidence is optional and. People cocoon themselves in their own existing belief system, as all the research says. 
So what, again, it goes back to how do you begin to, kind of the civil discussion, how do you, how do you sit at the table and have, and not have it be asymmetrical warfare? Where you know the sword of Damocles is the is the activist organization and the big bad wrong you know Aaron Brockovich defended uh, populists all against the uh, uh, against the company and I and I, I just think that that's where companies have to think strategically about engagement. So I'll just tell you a story where where Mark Firestone, who used to be the general counsel, it's amazing what business he went into, and we'll, uh, general counsel of Kraft used to always say, as his kind of North Star, as he looked at their kind of products and their distribution, he used this metaphorically, that a, Oreo is not a carrot. And no matter how much you want to talk about the protein value of a, of, a, of a, you know, and really just focus on the protein and not on the sugar and the fat and all that. And, and what he once did, which is an amazing thing, and I think it's, it's, it's bold, is he invited one of their most, you know, uh, uh, I think a, a civilly engaged, op not open, but uh, but uh, uh, an organization, I can't remember what NGO it was, really wanting to affect change and invited them to come and role play. He was going to play the role of the leader of that, uh, the ad NGO and vice versa. And the other was going to be him. Only, only Mark Firestone, if you know him, could pull this off. Uh, and they really, it really created, because they needed to create a context of symmetry. And that's what did it. They were role playing and suddenly, I mean, it's right. It's ripped out of like, you know, any Socratic method of teaching or or advocacy, and it may they came out of there agreeing on certain things and disagreeing on others. But until there is a willingness to see, what again, not all NGOs are equal, but many NGOs, as ha as 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 Daniel, you said so elegantly, they're here. They 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 own a lot of real estate in the in the in the and. Um, and I think you need to be selective and vet them carefully and your discussions, but create the context for engagement. That, that I just don't think there's any other choice. And it doesn't mean you have to be bullied. That's the whole point. If you're on your heels, you're going to lose. That's how you get knocked down. Daniel, you want to uh, add a little it's to just this? Just like a, on your this a luxury good uh, concept that's kind of gaining some currency here. <laughs> so I, I think that um, one thing that I see as just kind of a shading of that um, yes, it's true that uh, this is something that you know you see in like you know developed rich societies and so forth. But there's this this equal development of like a a very community engaged, very down to the ground, in particular in mining, uh, where uh, this is just basically a question of kind of you know community issues and community engagement. And mining companies are striding, struggling mightily and trying to get better in interacting with that. So I would say. Uh, not only is it is it, is there you know large real estate and we see it in like uh, in in developed countries, but this is a uh, we see it dramatically in Latin America now. We see it dramatically in India. Mm -hmm. We see it in in various other in Africa and so forth, and increasing now in China too, uh, particularly on environmental issues. So I would say that this is we we should not forget that this is kind of a global phenomenon that's really operating at a whole variety of different levels of development. Any, really, any extractive industry. In, absolutely. Because your neighbors are really critical. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Joe? Yes, John Buckley from uh, BNY Mellon. Um, in preparing for coming to today's event, I uh, yesterday uh, went to one of our Chicago high schools and uh, spent the day in an AP government class being taught by my son. And um, as part of that, he, he talked about the Iron Triangle. Uh, which I think applies here. Uh, we've, we've got the activists, we've got the government, we've got the corporations. And the way he was telling his high school students, you know, the corporations are trying to lobby the government for actions and so forth. But I, Roxanne's comments really get true to what I was also thinking about, and that is corporations' role and motivation here. We're, we're working on this governance gap, but we've got this issue of the corporation, what is their role? And, and Harlan talked about some companies that may survive for the long run because they make the right choices. But do we want to talk a little bit here about how we really see corporations, their board and leaders, making a transition here? Or do we have to accept what you said, Roxanne, at least for the generation of leaders we have now? And that's part of my hope, is the next generation of, of leaders might have a different view. But the leaders we have, are they? Are they really going to be able to make this transition into a, a different role? 
Well, let me just start out, and I'm sure everybody on the panel has a reaction to that. I think some are there, so I don't think you know there's there's some intractable kinds of kind of problem that the personalities of leaders in in the private sector are just antithetical to the forces of society, whether they're represented by activists or coming through government regulation. Um, and I do think that there are some industries that have begun to redefine, maybe not their role, but their uh, the value drivers that will create sustainable, profitable success. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a very, very senior guy in Shell who ran a, a chunk of the world for the upstream organization. And we were having a series of pretty fruitless conversations about some, uh, frankly, some community activists that were, who were interrupting his ability to proceed on a, a gas project, a gas development project. And he kept saying to me, um, but everything we're doing is legal. We have all the permits we need. We're complying with the highest international standards of environmental performance. I don't, it's not fair. It isn't fair because we're, we're a good guy. I mean, we're one of the best players. We're squeaky clean in terms of compliance. And I kept saying, but legal isn't enough. Your communities don't like you. And so long as we take the position we take, which is we talk at this level, they talk at this level, you're not going to proceed with this gas project. So forget fair and start thinking real. And, you know, and I can't say it was because I was so persuasive. But at a point in time, he said, oh, I get it. It's not enough anymore. And so I think within organizations, and I'm not going to be an apologist for Shell in any way, I'm proud of much that they do, and they make many mistakes. But for many companies that have continuous exposure like that and are constantly being pounded at the international level, the national level, and the local level, a lot of license to operate and license to grow language has become part of their strategic dialogue and, frankly, their planning process, which is beginning to shift sort of the thinking patterns of executives into something that is beyond how do I complete this contract at, in the least possible time at the lowest possible cost by investing the least in capital or process or whatever. And you know, for me, there's kind of some hope there, given that there hasn't been anything very creative that I've come across that actually rethinks the corporate structure or the kind of fundamental market forces around corporations. So you know, whether that's relevant in other industries, I don't know. But in extractive industries and heavy capital industries, some of that, I think, is beginning to create a different generation of thinking that may be hopeful. So we have time for a couple more questions. I've got at least three people on the list. Um, but it's up there, please. I very much welcome the, the questions that uh, the panelists have introduced. I mean, many of them are suggesting that we are uh, in uncharted uh, territory. What I'm worried is that we may be doing it from the wrong mindset, in the sense that we are using, uh, we tend, we are inclining more and using terms like um, gap, uh, self-regulation, uh, uh, and also activism, as opposed to social innovation, as opposed to co-creating new value, as opposed to literally advancing the good of all and in game-changing ways. And I wanted to invite you to basically very transparently uh, figure out where you are in the spectrum. At one extreme, you know, the freedman, the business of business is business and nothing more to the other extreme of saying the business of business is advancing the good of all because it's, it's the business of the future. And where do we lie in that spectrum? It's actually a, uh, where we start discovering new answers to the kind of questions that you have posed. And I'm curious to know where the panelists are when it comes to this. Daniel, would you like to have a go at that? Sure. Hey. Uh, so I, I'm, I am, I, so I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this idea of social innovation, and I think that there are many opportunities uh, to make this work. But I don't think that's the whole picture. And I think that there are, um, and I think we're like, uh, it's, it's, 
it's a li it, it's sometimes a little comforting to say there's this you know we have shared value and this and that and um, I, so I think that it's true in some areas and others it's not in others it's uh, it's um, it's a negotiation and there are different views and there are different goals and uh, they need to be negotiated and uh, and they need to be worked through I mean. Um, I think that uh, there have been many dramatic changes in corporate behavior, dramatic changes that were not driven by the desire for social innovation. Mm -hmm. Dramatic changes. And both in the kind of public side and in the private side. So I think we shouldn't, with all the excitement and enthusiasm for the possibility for social entrepreneurship and social innovation, we shouldn't forget that. That's, an that's another part and it's a little bit more less uplifting and I think a little bit more bare knuckle. and. Uh, and has, uh, has uh, words like politics and so forth in there, but uh, I think that's, that's the reality. Having said that, I think this, uh, this um, dichotomy between like Friedman on one side and us, I am so tired of this, I mean, of this, of this dichotomy. And I think that when I work with clients, um, and I'm sure you hear the same thing, Nobody talks about that. The only people that talk about that are like, uh, are like uh, some of my friends in academia, that are still thinking in these categories. Because for a, if you are leading um, a, a large company or you're on the board of a large company, that's your presence anyway. That's the reality anyway. So uh, whether you like it or not, and whether you, what your philosophical views are about that is, I think, from a practical point of view, largely irrelevant. Because you have to engage. You have to engage, and you have to engage to a level um, much more likely uh, or much more extensively than you've ever had. So I'm one of one of my goals is I want to I would love to go beyond that, beyond that debate, and really ask ourselves what are the concrete issues, what are the concrete dimensions that we have to tackle, and what are the real consequences, what are the real institutions, what are the real questions. That that's that's what I, that's what I love. But I'm I'm very sympathetic to your agenda. I would just like I would caution us to identify this issue uh, with social innovation because I think there's another dimension there that is, has, has very important social consequences that doesn't naturally fall into the social innovation category. So we got two more questions. Um, this lady here, whose name I can't see. My name is Gala. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gloria. Gloria, thank you. My name is Gloria Brown Marshall and I'm a professor of constitutional law at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. And I, my focus is um, around criminal justice in the US. And my question is, what about a situation in which the corporate and the government um, relationship is so intricately intertwined that it's difficult to figure out how to address the corporate actor, for example, with private prisons? So in dealing with private prisons, and the fact that we have, of course, um, 2.1 you know, million people incarcerated in the United States and trying to address activism associated with private prisons. How is that possible when you have actors that are so intricately connected? I mean, you, the panelists spoke of addressing the corporate actor individually. Private prisons are run by corporate actors. But there's this other side. And how do you, is there a, a way in which you can um, navigate around government as weak as it might be, but it's a necessary player because not all corporations are in a position where they can act alone. Many of them rely heavily on government intervention or regulation. It's when you a, mentioned the EPA, that's one of those you know, areas as well. Yeah, and it's actually an issue um, we've looked at as, as some of the, uh, those that are trying to get into that business um, it raises different issues than private educate or uh, privatized education. University of Phoenix, some of the the uh, um, for profit, I should say, for profit uh, education. And it, it, I I think you're quite and I'm, on a broad level. It's it. I don't think there's a bigger referendum on kind of the public private like what squarely belongs within the province of government and what kind of is in the middle and what is obviously with, falls within the province of um, the corporation or industry. Um, and I've read a lot about it. I'm not sure that I, I, I don't know where the facts are, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of activism going both ways. Most of it 
um, anti from what I've seen. And what in that particular case, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, I, th I think there, what hasn't been part of that discussion is what, and is who are, who kind of are, and we don't have these anymore, but we used to, the kind of the third party neutrals, to use a legal term. Who are those people who can broker that discussion and have, and again, it goes back to my kind of default, my bend in the straw, which is how do we have a constructive discussion where there's clearly points of view, mo behavior differently motivated, and in some ways in contradictory or, or, or um, con conflictual ways, to have a, a very honest discussion about that, about that, uh, that systemic change and how it affects all the different populations and all of the different interests that are involved. I, I, I view that issue as not different than, um, than, I don't want to say a constitutional amendment, but it is such a tectonic change, or titanic, if you want to use that, if it's not a good idea. It could, it could result, um, it, and that is like how, like, again, I think the, the, the question is a forensic one. How do we even have that discussion in a way that, again, where the, where the interests of, of, of business, the interests of government, and the interests of society, and, and there are more people, that, you know, there are different pockets of society that should be very vocal and very involved in this discussion, and have, a, you know, I don't, I don't think the government unilaterally gets to make that decision fundamentally, because it's too big a step. Thank you. So I know there are other questions, and we'll have an opportunity, I hope, for you to at least ask them to the, the panelists during the break. But uh, one more question from the gentleman in the back. Sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Prasad Kumar. I come from India. I'm uh, the business chairman and member of the holding board of that company. We develop airports, large power plants, and highways. Uh, this has been a very interesting discussion, but I think my question is, might uh, be a little unpopular in this setting. So I'll go for it anyway. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I, I refer to the earlier question of the three uh, constituencies. Uh, I'd like to focus on the activists. In all this discussion, is there a case for activists to review their credentials and motivations in this ecosystem, uh, which is always well-meaning. Can you repeat the question, please, sir? Is there a case for us to also, or for activists themselves, I mean the organized activists, yes. to review their own credentials and their motivations in this ecosystem? We haven't spoken anything about that. Okay, so the question concerns the, the, um, the internal assessment by the activists, as I understand it, of their own and in a uh, sense, their own motivations. And in, in a sense, where are they coming from? Response, Harlan? Yeah, I, I, what I, I, think it's, I think it's an excellent question and, and uh, eminently fair, because essentially that's the question when, when the, every business is asking, you know, is this, you know, is this legitimate you know, NGO? How much influence do they have? They do all kinds of... All kinds of um, studies, you know, all kinds of inquiry into that. They want to find every single reason not to, in many cases, not to engage. So they're looking at it from that vantage point. Um, I think responsible NGOs and the ones with whom we've worked, at least as I don't know how much how empirical this is, um, understand implicitly that their their sustainability model and is intri intimately and intricately tied to their 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 credibility and their and and the legitimacy, if you will, for, from any vantage point, from uh, influence based, authority based, whatever it is, that that's that that's what gives them the permission to play, and that's what. And we did the study that some NGOs are not trusted equally. There are some categories of NGOs that are at 80, 90 percent trust levels, and many that are at 38, 20. So I do think that that. That is a, I mean, I think there, there's not enough discussion, frankly, on that, because um, everyone's afraid to, you know, suddenly they're going to be the target, so if we're the ones who raise that question. But I do think that um, it happens sub rosa, but I do think that there needs to be a, a far better vetting process and equal, just as you're asking us to do, you two are accountable to that same standard. Thank you very much indeed. So I think at this point I'm going to call a hold. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank the panelists.